All right, folks, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas, uh, to our Stoic Saturdays. Today, I'm delighted to have Peter Stankovic. Yes, yes, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this is Peter. Hello, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and he's going to be talking about you his too. new book um, on Manual of Reformed Stoicism. Can we see the book? Ah, okay, wonderful. This, this is the one, and this is the previous one that was also in, uh, mentioned. Wonderful, wonderful. The one about uh, creativity, but yeah, go ahead. Excellent, so I want to give you, uh, tell you about the structure of this talk. Uh, so uh, Peter is going to make a short presentation about himself and his book. Uh, then I'm going to ask him some questions. Then I'm going to open up uh, for Q&A for everybody. You can start asking your questions right away. Uh, Peter, you don't look at the questions now. Uh, when the time comes for question and a question and session, I'm going to call upon people individually to actually ask their questions in person. All right, um, so that's the plan. And after this, we are going to go into the breakout rooms to discuss what Peter has presented in great amount of detail amongst ourselves. And then we're gonna come back and tell Peter about uh, what were our takeaways from this meet uh, meetup. All right, so with that, let me hand it over to Peter. Peter, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Again, thanks for having me uh, on this uh, nice Saturday. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Peter. I am, uh, well, I am a human being to start in a side way. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to run a uh, kind of a very, very short introduction. I, the, I believe that the discussion and Q&A is the most important part. Most important part. Uh, so just for the, um, for the basics, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a, I'm a philosopher, and I'm, uh, since I believe 2010 or something like that, I've been uh, seriously invested in, in investigating Stoic philosophy. And one of the basic, very deep premises that I, um, that I applied, that I've been living with, is that, uh, we, uh, if we, that we want to, uh, we the modern Stoics, we want to have Stoicism that is relevant, that is valid, that is a philosophy of life, for today that is actually philosophy that we can live by today in 2020 and that uh, this is something that we are um uh, that we want we do not want stoicism just merely a, a, a subject of the of a history textbook we want a stoicism that we need to live by and uh, that we may want to live by today and there this is this uh this is this line of approach and uh Quite quickly, I realized that if we want such a stoicism, we need to seriously, um, how, can I, how can I say that, update the ancient doctrine. I mean, there are certain things in, uh, in, 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 in the original stoicism, so to speak, that are binding, that are valid, that are perennial, and that are timeless, like, uh, let's say, the division into things in our power or outside our power, uh, like the idea that we do not live by the facts, but by the conception or the narrative about the facts, and so on and so on. So certain things are truly immortal, truly timeless, truly perennial, but other things, uh, we need a certain revision, and this revision sometimes takes place in the in the form of like reinterpretation, that there are certain uh, I, there were certain ideas in ancient stoicism that we need to uh, simply try to express in a more contemporary, in a more modern way, using our own language, our own ideas, our own how to say like conceptual framework from the 21st century, not from uh, not from 2000 years uh, back. Uh, so this is one thing. But sometimes it is, we need to take a, one step further and uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, get, maybe not get rid of certain stoic ideas, but uh, refocus, uh, for example, the concept of, uh, let's say, the concept of, of nature or the concept of, uh, of eternal return. There, there is a number of ideas, um, the rationality of universe and so on and so on. There, there is a number of ideas that I believe in in the 21st century, we as modern Stoics, we need to not look at, we need to focus on, on, uh, on other things, on the ethical teaching, on the study of our character, on how we apply the division of things uh, into things uh, in our power and outside of power, how we apply that to our modern life, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and so there is a number uh, in short, there is a number of, um, of revisions, reinterpretations, different, different emphasis, different, different, uh, different 
approaches in stoicism uh, and i believe this is a this is a fair approach i mean maybe it may ruffle some feathers but uh, of course this is what makes ideas living uh, by the way uh, and uh, i believe this is a this is a this is a fair approach i believe this is in uh, in line with the general uh, general uh, spirit of the stoic doctrine that is it's something that needs to evolve it is something that needs to be applied all the time to new circumstances and so on and so on uh, so this is basically my uh, my take here and uh, as a pr as a result of that i i published a book which i already have uh, shown uh, the manual for uh, the manual of reform stoicism basically uh, like it did happen in Christianity and did happen in Judaism. Uh, I believe that we can assume the name of reformed Stoics just to underline this uh, evolution and reformation and, and, and change in, uh, in, in our approach to Stoicism. So, so this is basically it for the idea of uh, reinterpretation and reformation of Stoicism. But besides that, and I, uh, I saw that mentioned in the, in the, in the email before our meeting, I, I'm an also, I am also an author, the author of another book, a book which is about uh, stoicism and artistic creativity. Uh, this is something kind of different, for a slightly different topic than reform stoicism. Basically, I'm uh, in a way analyzing the, the big question whether or not a stoic can be a creative artist. I mean, I, I, I agree that stoicism is a, a certain ideal of human life and that artistic creativity, being a creative person, an artist, is, a, is another ideal, another pinnacle of human spirit, or uh, however you wanna, you wanna call that. And the question that I, I analyze in this book is whether or not these two ideals can be pursued uh, at the same time by the same uh, person. As we know from history, there are many, many, there, there have been many, many artists whose life was, you know, at odds, to say the least, with the with the ideal of stoicism, uh, and sometimes we kind of conceptualize artists as, as people who live uh, in a more more haphazard, more risky, more more turbulent way than the stoic sages. So the big question is whether is there a real conflict or is it just a stereotype? So this is the other book, and um, yeah, I uh, I promised a short introduction, so I am uh, totally open to any line of conversation here. Yeah. Uh, and any line of like, like a more detailed inquiry because I, I didn't even pretend to kind of you know uh, revise the entire book or recap the entire book. It's just the, this is the this is the outlook, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions, including critical questions. Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start out by asking you questions. Uh, your second book looks fascinating, so I'm going to ask you about both the books. Absolutely. Um, and then um, I'm going to uh, invite everybody else to go ahead and put your questions in uh, in chat. So I'll go largely in the order in which the questions are uh, that come in. So please go ahead and get your questions in early. There are going to be lots of questions. Um, all right. So first question. Uh, first, let me focus on the um, reform stoicism. Absolutely. Um, if you wanted to pick up like the top few, maybe top three ways in which stoicism needs to be updated mm -hmm. to be most effective today because what really matters i think uh, we are on the same page you know you go to ideas in order to live you yes. know these ideas allow you to live better that is the purpose of the ideas and um you know we owe a de great de deal of debt to people who came before us like the stoics and we learn a lot from them. We stand on their shoulders. But if you stand on someone's shoulder, you should be able to see further, not only what they saw. And what has happened is a lot has happened uh, since uh, they wrote what they did. So what are the big ways in which stoicism needs to be reformed for it to be the most effective for a person trying to use philosophy today? That's a, uh, that's a, that, 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 that's a, there's a possibility to talk like for an hour here. It's difficult to, to cherry pick. Uh, so as I, um, one of the, one of the things that, um, uh, one of the, one, one of the things that, uh, in a way happened since original stoicism was invented is that uh, two millennia have passed. There is, a, there is a vast stretch of time that, has, uh, that, that, that flew by. And we need to, in a way, uh, this, this kind of a basic tenet is that we need to 
uh, apply whatever happened at that time, whatever was invented, created uh, during these two millennia, we need to take all that into account. And I mean, all, all of the you know, philosophical uh, developments, the advent of science and the establishment of science, which was simply not the case. We, Marcus Aurelius you know, didn't have science in his time. So this is something we need to take into account, but also social transformations, political implications, and so on and so on and so on. So the, one thing is that we need to be open to, on this kind of more abstract level, we need to be open to a discussion with different currents that are may seem wild, may seem wild or weird from the stoic perspective, but we cannot, you know, close off, we cannot, uh, we cannot follow only uh, this time. I mean, we cannot uh, stick to stoic books only. We need to confront them with the uh, with other currents of thought and with other schools of uh, with other schools of how to live. So that would be general one general thing. The second thing is that uh, uh, second point is that I believe that we need to allow much more, in a way, um, diversity and autonomy than the ancient Stoics required. Uh, what I mean is that uh, in the twenty first, I mean as I take it, the, um, the approach in, the, in ancient Stoicism was that uh, Stoicism is the best way to go for everyone, that everyone that in some ideal world, in this kind of cosmopolis or, or, or how, however you want to call that, uh, every citizen would be wi a wise person and uh, therefore everything would be perfect, that this uh, great goal of Stoicism would be turning everyone into, into a sage and then you know, everyone would be better off. I believe uh, in in uh, in, um, in in today's stoicism, particularly in reform stoicism, we need to we need we, we need to we need kind of a softer take that we need to uh, take into account that for some people, like maybe for example, romantic artists, right, like cursed poet, he might not be or uh, you know a troubled uh, troubled writer. They may not want to be stoics in order to pursue different w ways of life, like a creative life, right? Just an example. But we need to take into account that certain people may simply not want to uh, follow the stoic crowd. They may want to be you know try their ways uh, in a in a different way of life. So this is this is one thing uh, that in in certain in, for certain types of personalities in certain in, in certain conditions, stoicism just might be for some people might be not the best way to go. So it is in a way up to anyone to decide whether or not they're going to uh, be stoic, you know, be stoics or not. So diversity. Uh, there are different types of, of uh, different types of people, different psychologies, and maybe stoicism is just not for everyone. Uh, another thing, uh, the in a way emphasis, third point, emphasis on uh, on human autonomy in the way that I believe. In the, in the modern world, we need to, as Stoics, we need to take responsibility for our own, in a way, for organizing our own values and goals that we are trying to pursue in life. Of course, they need to be rational, they, they need to be coherent, they need to uh, stick to certain uh, say, certain framework that, uh, that Stoicism furnishes. But in a way, it is much more up to us than the ancients had thought we need to focus on what we uh, on what we want to achieve and how we want, we want to achieve that and which particular way of life we are going to pursue uh, instead of kind of trying to figure out what the uh, what the what the rational organization of the universe is and just you know sticking to it and following the pre preordained path so in short I believe that uh, today in reform stoicism, uh, I have less faith in this preordained pre uh, order of universe and much more emphasis in, on autonomy and on, on personal responsibility for our for the course of our actions. Uh, just to not speak too long, uh, maybe the final point, the most controversial mm -hmm. one, probably uh, the problem of nature. I am. This is one of the banner points in, uh, in the, one of the banners of stoicism that we need to, you know, follow nature, uh, life in agreement with nature, consistency with nature, consistency with nature, and so on and so on and so on. But I do have a problem with that. I believe that in the 21st century, uh, 
for a, for a number of reasons, the uh, just sticking to the idea, uh, blindly sticking to the to the idea of following nature and just assuming that everything that is natural is good, is simply uh, is not enough to say the least. Just following nature doesn't really lead us anywhere uh, today. We need, in a way, go much more and uh, much further than that. We need to take much more on much more personal responsibility and not just stop at trying to abstractly figure out what uh, what is in agreement with nature and what is not. Okay. And I, I, I can go on like that. I, I know, I know. So, uh, so uh, what I will do is that I will ask more pointed questions so we can cover the same area uh, sequentially. So yeah. let me start by asking you, what are the tenets, fundamental tenets of the ancient Stoicism which are still the cornerstone stone of what you call reform stoicism. What remains? Um, what, what principles? Now, all, most of us are familiar with stoicism, the ancient stoicism. So what are the principles that remain? Yes, and this is something, that I, I have a clear answer, a clear, concise answer here. First of all, I believe, as I mentioned already, the division of things into that which is in our power and outside our power. This is number one thing. This is something I start my book with. This is something I believe, if anything is timeless in the world, this is probably this uh, principle. Uh, so this, although on the other hand, we need to, I, I believe that, uh, for example, when, when it comes to uh, a certain mental phenomena, uh, modern psychology will teach us that certain things that happen in our mind may be, uh, may, may be out of our control, contrary to what the uh, ancient Stoics said. Uh, so in a way, this, uh, this set of things that, uh, that are within our power may be smaller uh, than the ancients uh, had thought, which, which is just this kind of reformation or recalib recalibration. It doesn't uh, deny it doesn't falsify the entire principle because the principle is still valid. This, this is so, so dichotomy of control survives. Exactly. Yes. Okay, what else? Uh, what else survives? The idea that, of course, the idea that we need to focus only on the things that are in our power, uh, mm -hmm. but that's, that's number one. Number two is the idea that um, Marcus Aurelius calls, uh, calls this um, conceptions, I believe, in, in most English translations. Uh, I, in, in my book, in, in Reform Stoicism, I call it uh, the narratives about things, but the, the idea is holding, and this is still the same, that uh, our happiness, our misery, our satisfaction or dissatisfaction in life is not decided by the facts, events, and outside uh, settings and circumstances themselves, but the narratives, the conceptions, the, our conceptions, our thoughts about these uh, things. This is number two. And these That's probably awesome. would be two absolutely uh, fundament, fundamental cornerstone. If I, if, if I, if I were to, to name three of them, sure. uh, paradoxically, the idea that the goal of everything here uh, is how to be happy, which is in a way banal, this kind of a obvious thing, but uh, we need to, I believe this is worth mentioning that the entire goal of Stoic philosophy and broadly, uh, the entire goal, goal of having a philosophy of life is to have a good life. This is the goal of it, that the goal is in practice. This is how that we need to, we need a philosophy which we live by and which leads us towards happiness, nirvana, however you want to call that, but the, that, the, that the proof is in the practice. This is the, this is obviously So, point. So what you're referring to is the idea of, sto you know, uh, calling them Stoics, that this is something not to be, Kind of not to be studied in monasteries or some you know kind of universities, but this is something that you you do philosophy yes. in open life in a, as a way of improving your life uh, by talking to people and by working with people and implementing those ideas in in real life. Is that is that yes. what you're saying? Okay, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. So those three things remain. Now let let me answer. Let me ask the first question in a slightly different way. If you want to look at fields from where um, there are indications that we need to update the stoicism. So for example, one field would be maybe psychology, modern psychology is one field. So what are the various fields that have developed? What, what, what is the human progress that you're trying to abstract from? in order to figure out what principles need to be added to stoicism? 
Um, yes. So basically, one thing is uh, something I didn't uh, I did mention, but just briefly, science. I mean, science is this something which is absolutely crucially important in our time. Uh, science and technology that ensues. Uh, th and this is something that the ancient Stoics didn't have the chance to, you know, to think about because they didn't have science in our, uh, in our sense of the term. So from the scientific point of view, from, in a way, from the philosophy of science point of view, this is one, uh, this is one very serious, as you call it, field that, uh, that makes us, you know, think twice about certain tenets of, uh, of Stoicism. Basically, I believe that uh, Stoicism, reform Stoicism is a very, pro-scientific uh, philosophy that we need science we uh, we uh, we embrace science we need to get everything that we can from science uh, we acquire all the data from science and then we use that to live uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a stoic way that there is if you deny science you are you are not a stoic that that, that, that might be this claim sure. so, so mm -hmm. the scientific perspective we need to uh, have a certain relationship with science that uh, that's number one uh, number two probably uh, is the um, in a way technological advancement and whatever um, you know the, the 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 technological the problems that uh, technology poses to the concept of nature because in uh, in antiquity nature was in a way uh, in a way a uh, self-defined concept when i read marcus aurelius i don't really find a definition of uh, of uh, uh, of nature it was kind of self-evident today in the world that we can you know change our dna maybe not change but you know study our dna go to the moon do all the number of things have an online meeting on zoom you know mm -hmm. technology by its very existence asks very very serious question about what is natural and what is not natural is it natural that we talk you know from the us to europe like yes right <laughs> So this is this is another the entire all the problems with uh, with the concept of um, of nature. That's uh, that would be probably number uh, number two and number three. Uh, a purely psychological perspective. I mean, uh, modern psychology uh, teaches us a, a very long number of, uh, of things about how human mind works, and uh, hopefully it turns out. I mean, fortunately and and glad for, uh, gladly it turns out that the the ancient Stoics kind of uh, you know, sorted it out 2,000 years ago. So we have this uh, many, many a time, we have this nice, uh, nice consistency between stoicism and modern, uh, and modern, uh, modern psychology, but we still need to kind of be able to relate with what uh, psychology t teaches us. Do we want to, as stoics, do we want to treat uh, psychology as a proof that stoicism works or just kind of auxiliary thing that in, it's just an added proof or something? What's the relationship here? So that is number, uh, so this is probably number, uh, number three. three. Yeah, there is science, technology, and psychology. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so I want to approach the same, uh, I want to approach this in a slightly different way. Um, so let's take the four stoic virtues and see uh, the ancient version of it and how the updated version of it looks like. So let's, let's start with the virtues, the virtue of temperance. Does that change any? Uh, so you want you, you want a yes or no answer here? No, not yes or no. You can you can you can uh, put it qualitatively. You can say, uh, like like for example, I mean one <laughs> clear example I have is that of uh, kind of prudence or rationality. So mm -hmm. for example, everything that we know about scientific method of kind of using our mind, all of that is really a kind of major upgrade of kind of prudence, something like that. So uh, you know, in what ways? those four virtues being practiced today are going to be different from four virtues back practiced a 2000 years ago question for me because i don't really uh i don't really uh, in my book i don't really focus on on virtues uh in the way that uh which is which, which is not to say that i'm kind of uh i uh, i deny their existence or that i'm kind of trying to i'm saying that they're not holding anymore or something like that i just kind of Try a different approach. I don't really, uh, I don't, I, I don't really lay out um, stoicism through 
uh, virtues. So in a way, I believe that they they all hold, and that you, for example, when you when you have temperance, I totally agree that temperance is. A, I mean, there is no disagreement. There is nothing in a way nothing interesting to say. Just simply temperance holds. What is interesting is that in the other book, in the book on uh, on artistic creativity, uh, I do analyze something which I call. Uh, the ascetic and misinterpretation of stoicism, this kind of a widely spread um, stereotype concept that uh, if you want to be a stoic, you need to you know, live by uh, bread and, and water, you need to have no uh, sexual intercourse, you have to eat very, I mean, just bread, drink only water, no alcohol, and no pleasures, and basically nothing. Uh, this is the there is widespread uh, image of, uh, of of stoicism as as, you know, as as this path, and I argue that it is not the case. This is just a kind of a misconception. The the point of stoicism that is, is that we through to use your your approach through uh, the virtue of temperance through temperance we are able to deal with life as it is. We are able to deal with much more ways and walks of life. Than just than just this narrow ascetic path of living very frugal, simple life. So extreme simplicity, this kind of extreme minimalism, and, and just abstaining from from things this is just one way. And stoicism is much broader. So in a way, from from my perspective, proper understanding, for example, of the if proper understanding of virtues, for example, of the virtue of temperance, exact enables enables us to do exactly. Uh, that that would be my take, which is kind okay. of slightly from a different perspective, but I believe it. Sure, sure. Okay, so then let me go back to the three fields and let's let me go focus on each of them to see what else we can get from it. So for or let me start with technological. I mean, one of the obvious things that has happened is that there has been an industrial revolution, where the ability of human beings to transform our surroundings has gone through the roof of exactly. you know like in the in the ancient times, a grandchild's, a grandson's life is not that different from the grandfather's life. Exactly. It's pretty much nothing much changes actually. Whereas, you know, within a year, within a two years, everything changes. And that's what our, you know, that's, that's the, uh, so the sheer capacity we have to transform nature has gone up. Um, the principle that there are some things that are within your control and not within your control remains the same. So I think dichotomy of control survives fully, but I think that kind of what can you control uh, in terms of, you know, through, through technology, through science, I think has changed. So I think that that's one thing that I can see, you know, very much. Um, the on science, I see kind of a massive expansion of rationality. Um, you know, Stoics are very big on rationality, mm -hmm. but you know, science has fleshed that out far more uh, you know, thanks to, you know, people like Newton onwards, just, mm -hmm. it's just a radical transformation of what it means to be rational and what are the issues involved? How do you deal with it? All of that. So I think there is this entire corpus in science. And, uh, but the thing that I'm really puzzled about, I mean, I want to not puzzled about, but I want to um, tease out more. What do you consider to be the fundamental new things we have learned about psychology that we can add to stoicism? Uh, maybe not. So first of all, I basically, I, I totally agree with what you said about rationality and about science as being, yeah. So basically this is it. Uh, new things from psychology. Um, basically that, uh, um, that for example, from I believe, uh, it, and it refers to it would refer to what I mentioned before, that our control of uh, our our authority over our own mind is in a way smaller or weaker than mm -hmm. the ancients had mm -hmm. thought. When I read the ancient Stoics, uh, when I read Seneca, for example, you have this impression. I mean, at least I get the impression that they kind of assumed that it is easier to uh, change your own mind than to change the external world. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, this is, I, I mean, in a way it is true, but uh, they kind of assume that it is this kind of super easy, I mean, super easy thing to mm -hmm. change your own thoughts. And on some level, of course, it holds because we believe that 
you know, stoicism works. But on the other hand, after everything we learned from psycho psychoanalysis, let's say that certain a certain traumas or certain uh, misconceptions or certain patterns of behavior can last for years and may be highly difficult to change. They may be subconscious. We may even not even know about them. Uh, this is in a way uh, a bit challenging to stoicism. And and here, as a step back, is uh, uh, I think we need we, we need we need to stay, we need to take a step back. Uh, which again doesn't falsify the entire principle, but we simply need to accept that certain things may be that happen that tend to happen in our in our mind may be out of our control. Uh, the principle holds the best the best way we can uh, we can go about that is to to um, again take a step back and uh, ask ourselves what what we can do about these facts. But basically, that would be certain mental. Uh, facts we need to treat uh, just, out, uh, just as uh, outside uh, facts. And I, I'm not a professional psychologist. I won't, I won't name you, you know, certain uh, specific uh, phenomena. But for example, the thing with, uh, with traumas or with, uh, with certain patterns of behavior, we know, you know, psychology teaches us that it is an empirical fact that for people, if they are not stoics and if they are not uh, in therapy, uh, it is easier for them, a kind of more natural, to use the word, uh, more natural for them to reorganize their, their entire lives, their patterns of behavior, their job, their everything, then simply change the thing that it is in their mind. So we know that from uh, from psychology. And uh, what makes stoicism fascinating today and the stoic challenge so fascinating is that we need to uh, we need to have a uh, dialogue with this uh, psychological tradition and knowledge. Excellent. Excellent. Now I want to go to the uh, your uh, second book. I'm actually very fascinated with it. Yes. So tell me, tell me about. Um, so what what is the title of the book? And the title of the book is uh, "Does Happiness Write Blank Pages on Stoicism and Artistic Creativity?" And I I do I do see see some smiles here. So I believe that the title speaks for itself. The idea is that in artistic creativity, there is this widespread assumption. And the big question is, it is it just an assumption, a stereotype, or is it, is, is it something real? An assumption that if you are a perf perfectly happy, perfectly satisfied person, then you won't be able to create meaningful art and kind of deeply moving and uh, you know life changing and uh, world changing works of art it is a widespread assumption uh, and the, we know from the observation of how artists live you know certain crazy uh, rock and roll stars and, and and other people that sometimes artists do uh, inflict pain to speak simply inflict pain and torment themselves in order to kind of keep the fire going to keep the inspiration going and this is this question is is there a real problem you're in there is it a, 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 a do you have to choose whether you're going to pursue the life of stark satisfaction or of artistic inspiration or can you kind of work your way uh together the, i mean between them Okay, Peter. So let me ask you the question: How do you how do you work, make make this work together? How do you have both? Uh, how do you have the stoic equanimity and yeah, artistic creation? I don't have that. The, the, the entire book is not about it. The, the book is not proving that it is possible. The, the book is investigating whether or not it is possible, and there is no uh, there is no just you know uh, there is no concrete yes or no outcome of these books. In some context, you are in, in, in some understanding of, uh, of art and in some um, you know, ways of understanding artistic inspiration, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is feasible, it, it is more possible to, you know, to go with this stoic equanimity. But sometimes, uh, for example, for the romantic understanding of art, uh, it, just is, it just is not possible. Sometimes there is a real conflict. Sometimes you, if you, you, you have to choose. Uh, so this is the this is it. There, there is a, it's not it's not uh, it's not a clear cut thing. You sometimes have an actual conflict in there. Yeah, I mean, what what I have found, I mean, I I, I very I like write every day, um, and I have friends who write a lot um, creatively, and what I have found is that we have actually, uh, I mean, this is kind of based on modern psychology mm -hmm. of you know Daniel Kahneman, people like that of System One and System Two. What I found is that 
we have these two faculties. You have a creative faculty, which is an intuitive faculty, which is a free flowing faculty, mm -hmm. which responds immediately, which brings mm -hmm. back, brings with it all your lived experience and emotions kind of flowing. Uh, so that's one kind of faculty we have. And we have the other kind of faculty, which is a rational faculty, deliberative faculty, which is able to analyze, apply rules, things like all that. Right. And what, what in, initially, what we have, essentially what I found is that being able to switch between them, shuttle between them. Uh -huh. and go back and forth is an amazing way of producing good things fast. So that's what I'm going to be talking about yes, all day that, that is exactly tomorrow. What I'm yes, yes. Oh, that's, okay. that's probably, that's probably yeah. the, perfect, the perfect, if you can do that, then you need, uh, then you need no stoicism. You, need, you don't need nothing. You are just a perfect human being. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, no, no, my, my, my friend that, has been right. Yeah. Using, can I, I mean, using your, because it's a very fine distinction and using your terms, the, the big question I'm, try, I'm kind of investigating uh, in the book is uh, if and how the stoic rationality can live together with this, as you call it, free flowing, free, fl free flowing, a faculty of, you know, of, uh, of inspiration and, uh, and this kind of a flow uh, of things. This is, this is the question. If, if you apply this rationality, coherence, structures, uh, and so on and so on and so on, uh, doesn't the, this kind of, you know, vague inspirational element doesn't just, you know, blow away, doesn't disappear. This is the problem here. And the, if you want to, the optimistic answer would be that uh, you can ha somehow have them together. And as you said, shuttle uh, between them. That's one of the ways to go here. Now, whether or not this is possible for everyone and how, you know, is, isn't it too hard sometimes? This is, this is an open debate. But this is basically this part, and this is exactly the, the problem here. Uh, if you want more specifics here, I, I can give you just, you know, two, two kind of you know, examples from different, uh, from different uh, you know, discourses. First of, sure. first of all, uh, as you, if you, you, you are a creative person, so you know that there is a problem of, you know, dealing with criticism, like, you know, you, you, you try to publish a book and they don't want to publish it or no one wants to read that. You know, someone hey, you know, someone someone says says bad things on your work, and, and so on. How to deal with that? This is because of the you know psychology of of creativity. It is intrinsically hard to do, and definitely stoicism, with all its teachings, can obviously help with that. It is you know basically how to deal with uh, with uh, bad things that people say. This is you know well known. No need to discuss that. So that 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 that, that for sure can help. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, from a completely different, you know, uh, way of thought. In Stoicism, in Orthodox Stoicism, in original Stoicism, we have the idea of eternal return, that, you know, things go understood in this or that way, but basically that things in the world go uh, in, a, in a cycle that they repeat themselves. Some will say in a literal sense, some will say in a more abstract sense, but that they repeat, they repeat themselves. There is nothing new under the sun and so on and so on. If you have that view and if you have the view that the, that the creative person needs to create something which is essential and radically new every time, radically fresh, this kind of, you know, creating a new alphabet to describe the world and so on and so on, you would have a conflict because here you have there is nothing new under the sun. Here you have the necessity to to produce something new, and there is a conflict. So, yeah, I mean, I th th there are two ways. We did a whole series of meetups on Carl Jung, and he has one take on this. And I think Stoicism also has one take on it. Like these two faculties that I'm talking about, the the automatic faculty that we have, our emotional mechanism, how we react to things. If you regard that as part of nature, you know, like. Carl Jung regards that as a part of self. So that's just who, what it is. And you just have to have a kind of acceptance towards it while your kind of your will, your ability of paying attention, your ability to evaluate as being something that is within your control. So the way in which uh, Carl Jung puts it is that the unconscious is one thing and the conscious is the mm. other thing. And uh, I think Stoicism advocates profound respect and kind of acceptance of the unconscious or the self or the nature, whatever you want to call it. So, and that's part of your kind of, if you regard that as a part of your creative process, then you just kind of give it the space it needs to operate. At the same time, you still have your conscious, you still have your, uh, you know, your courage, your ability to pay attention, which is what, you know, 
you have mm-hmm. the other part of the uh, dichotomy of control. So, wow, this is this is fascinating. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can give you this. What please. you just said sounds like a very nice follow up uh, mm-hmm. to my book on stoicism and creativity because it kind of takes the next step. I mean, because I, uh, I investigate the problem in a you know, purely philosophical way, and now we give this kind of a practical advice that having that all that taken into account what to do if you want to give it a shot. So, the, and this is, this sounds, this sounds Peter, really Peter, come tomorrow at 2.30. I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm going to do a full meetup just on that, on how do, you, how do you do this? Because this is what I've been doing for the past like 10 years or so of writing. So um, I, I, I believe there is a kind of <laughs> rational, rational coherence of thought here. So I, I didn't really expect that. So, okay, but yeah, these are the, basically these are the problems that we are, we are trying to deal with here. So wonderful. Uh, let's open it up to questions. There is a lot of people who have been patiently waiting. Uh, give me just a second. I'm going to enable Thank you them for to your unmute. Patience. There's a virtue in the orthodox stoicism and reform stoicism too. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So it's going to be, uh, so folks, um, you can line up for questions by typing your question, typing exclamation mark or raising your hand in Zoom. Um, try to keep your questions brief so we can get to as many questions as possible. So it's going to be Gabriel, Zeno, Steve, Jean, and Loy next. Uh, Gabriel, go ahead. Gabriel, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Zeno. Zeno, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Jean Dobre, Jean Dobre. Uh, I lived in, in Warsaw for a year uh, after leaving Amsterdam in 77. So I, I love your country. Uh, yeah, so I, have a, I put my question down before you even started talking, but then we started talking about psychology and the way it fits in there. Um, so I wonder what it is to live as a Stoic in a non-Stoic society. <laughs> That's the most important question of all. Right, and even like a non-Stoic family. Um, and so I wonder, I, I thought about this a bit, uh, and maybe it shows that I don't quite understand Stoicism, but I, it seems to me that it leads to cognitive dissonance. In the following situation where uh, suppose I'm married, we have a kid, and our daughter in college uh, has an accident and dies. Uh, my wife um, is not a Stoic, and she is uh, speechless. She is uh, suffering, uh, and she expects me to express my uh, love for her and for her daughter in, in, uh, in signs of suffering, I would think. She wants to live through this suffering with me. And so I cannot really be my usual stoic and say, yeah, it's outside my control. I cannot do anything about this. So uh, I need to pretend that I'm suffering. Uh, we talked about this in this Thank group. you. Uh, th- thank you, Zeno. Um, yes. uh, folks, uh, let's keep our questions short so we so can have is, as many people. Uh, is this, yeah. yeah. Is this a, is this a, uh, <clears throat> is there a cognitive dissonance in, in stoicism of people that live with fa- family members have to pretend emotion? Uh, I, I think it's a very fair question. I believe the answer is uh, very is simple but paradoxical. Uh, in a way, uh, in a way, I, I oftentimes I feel uh, that other that that people around me are much better stoic than I am. Uh, in the way that uh, I don't really have to, uh, you know, pretend to anyone. Uh, I mean, it's all, all the time with me. It's uh, kind of you know trying and failing. Whatever situation is thrown at me, uh, I need to kind of live up to the to the stoic ideas, and it's always trying to you know to 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 um, to keep to the uh, to the stoic level, but oftentimes, uh, like mostly in, in, in uh, maybe the the usual thing I uh, the, 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 my usual experience is that people around me, uh, even if they have nothing to do with stoicism, they do cope quite well, and do, they even in, in in difficult situations they are they are getting by. 
And it is me who needs to all the, you know, stoic, stoic teachings and principles to be on par with them. So it's not a problem that other people are kind of emotional or, or, or chaotic or, or, or not dealing with, them pro with themselves properly. Uh, in my case, it's mostly me who need to, uh, who needs to, to, you know, to, 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 to live by the stoic standard, to try to live by the stoic standard. But in other words, it's all the, about the cognitive dissonance. It's all, it's trying and failing all the time, I believe. It's just, you know, you, you try to, uh, just a second. Let me sort it. The, in, in a way, you have the cognitive dissonance all the time, but it just needs that you that, that you need to try uh, try again, and then you then you fail a bit, and they then you try uh, try on another day, and so on and so on. So in a way, I, I don't believe in, in my, at least in my very personal experience, it's not like an either or situation that I in in a click I change myself into a perfectly perfectly stoic sage uh, I'm just trying to to work on myself and I'm trying to as they say fail better and I'm trying to kind of you know work my uh, my way toward this uh, this stoic goal uh, and it's mostly kind of you know uh, a cognitive dissonance with in myself not between myself and the world okay next up is Steve Steve go ahead okay so can you hear me a little bit louder, please. All right, so Peter, um, in your response to Srikant's uh, first question, you made a few points. And in your uh, uh, Steve, could you speak closer to the mic? We can barely hear you. All right, how about now? Yeah, much better. Okay, so in response to uh, Srikant's first question regarding um, like what are the top three things that Stoicism needs to update, you kind of mentioned a um, diversity of ideas and holistic integration of other philosophies. And I wondered if your reform stoicism was more of like a this integrative philosophy approach and not so much stoicism centric. Do you care to respond to that, Peter? Uh, I'm not sure if I uh, if I I heard well. Uh, it was difficult to hear, but I heard well. But I'm not sure if I understand the the, the question correctly. Uh, but the thing is that uh, I do believe that uh, reform stoicism. Uh, is in a way an open project, so to speak. It, 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 this philosophy is, is open, and if you want to go with, uh, and this is how I'm, my book on uh, reform stoicism is, tr is structured, it's 20, 25 or 26 chapters, and I am uh, I'm perfectly happy for any reader and for any uh, for any disciple of stoicism to kind of focus on the, the part they uh, they want to focus on and for me myself there is a number of uh, of ideas that I live by I'm trying to live by I'm trying to focusing on and and, and others uh, and other uh, other things are not so much uh, kind of uh, inspiring for me so in a way it is not integrated it is kind of a free um, a kind of a an open endeavor and you I believe that you and I and everyone else need to in a way consciously and autonomously and responsibly uh, define their uh, their take on this uh, on this project and how they can uh, use that to to live a more satisfying life. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it does uh, specifically answer your question, uh, but but this is the, this is the way the way I feel. The uh, the, the uh, stoicism, in my experience, again, is not like this kind of a solid. A uh, very extremely coherent, perfectly defined uh, corpus or of dogmas. It is more like a certain way of approaching things that you need to try to apply to your own life. Thank you. Next up is Jean. Jean, go ahead. Uh, Jean, could you go ahead and unmute? You're still muted. Okay, next up is Loy. My question is written out there. Um, what do you think of using uh, stoic methods uh, for, an, for a simple, healthy life? Uh, the the ep Epicurean ideal? I think they do combine very well, but I just want your input. Uh, now I did have some problems with uh, making out the question, but you asked. Uh, 
Uh, uh, yeah, right? well, yeah he's, he's, she's asking what is the relationship between stoic ideal and epicurean ideal? Yes, and that's a very perfect question and I'm very glad you asked that. I'm very glad you asked that because I believe that uh, that uh, epicureanism uh, is the philosophy, in my understanding, is this philosophy of, uh, let's say, ultimate temperance. It's a philosophy that is focused on temperance only, that you need to have this kind of uh, utopia of negative hedonism that you need to in epicureanism you need to focus you need to live by a uh, you, you you need to kind of scale down your entire life to these very simple pleasures like having a wine with your friends uh, you know living very simply very frugally and just focusing on that narrow path and doing only that the, and the difference between epicureanism and stoicism and i totally in this book, I, I very much like this question, and this is exactly the argument I, I pursue in this book. Uh, the, the difference with Stoicism is, is that Stoicism is in a way much broader. You, applying sto uh, on the Stoic platform, so to speak, you are able to uh, deal with a much more widespread a gamut of ways of life. You, as a Stoic, you can be a politician, you can be a writer, you can try to be a writer, you can be a soldier, you can be a business person, you can be basically whatever you want within reason, of course. You, you shouldn't be, be a murderer or a criminal or, or someone like that, but the there is a wide diversity of, uh, of the walks of life you can pursue Stoically. In Epicureanism, the, the, the path is much, much uh, more narrow. You, the, the, the simplicity of life, the frugality of life, this is it. In Stoicism, you are able to, uh, to wander on the much more uh, ways of life. And I believe this is a very nice question. And this, uh, this, this juxtaposition between Stoicism and Epicureanism is a very instructive one. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Next up is Jeff, followed by Joe, followed by Alex. Jeff, go ahead. Jeff, are you there? I am. Go ahead. Hi, Shrikant. So uh, my question is um, a question with regard to a possible update. It seems to me that the, the one circle with things that are simply within my control and things that are simply outside of my control um, is a little bit too simplistic. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, I would draw another circle. And inside of, of you know, that, that, uh, that outside circle, between the smaller circle, are things that I might be able to influence. Technically, they are outside of my control, mm -hmm. but they, all, they are also things that I might focus on that are beyond simply things that I can control. Uh, those... Jeff, Jeff, they have, uh, the Stoics have a standard answer for that. So let, let okay. Peter give that. Peter, go okay. ahead. Yes, they, the Stoics ha do have the standard answer for that. I, I hope that my standard answer will be uh, the same as yours. Uh, and so the, the simple answer is that uh, you are, I don't agree. You, I, I don't think you're right. Uh, and this is a problem that the, the ancient Stoics have themselves discussed uh, many, many times. The, the entire idea of this dichotomy of control is that you need to divide in two, that there is no middle ground, there is no in-between, no gray area. There are only things that you are able to control 100% and that they are things that you, that you do not control 100%. And the, the ethical power, the entire uh, magnificence, the entire, the, the, the entire power of this principle comes from the, the sharpness of, the, of this division. Uh, but but let, let me remind you, the thing is that you, uh, the, in Stoicism, the, the thing is that, the, 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 uh, that you divide into, into the, the two sets of things that, first of all, you are able to control fully, and these that you are not able to control fully, but you can, you, you can have some control over them, but it is not full control. But for the, from the Stoic point of view, it is not that interesting whether you have 90% or 19 or 50% of control. The, the only question that is important from the Stoic perspective is whether or not you have 100% authority and power over something or not. Uh, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 please continue, uh, Peter. Sorry to interrupt. No, that would be it. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, Jeff, uh, I can tell you that you are not the only one who, who tends to think this way. For example, William Irvine, the uh, American Stoic, uh, author of a number of books on Stoicism, in his first book, uh, 
I believe it was called A Guide to Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. He basically entertains the, this idea too, that, we, that, 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 that the dichotomy of control should be changed into the trichotomy of control and, and the division into three uh, subset. This is something I do not believe in. I believe that, the, as I said, the sharpness and clarity of this division makes it powerful and, uh, and timeless. Uh, the, uh, so Jeff, I would add just one thing to uh, what Peter said. There is a concept that Stoics had, uh, have, which is called indifference. Uh, so there is like preferred indifference and um, unpreferred indifference. Uh, so indifferent means, uh, so, so the, 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 uh, this confusion um, is rooted in the concept, the distinction between value and virtue. The stoic virtue, uh, stoic ethics is a virtue ethics. So whatever is within your control is something that you can do something about. So it's all about whether you take the action that, you're, that you need to take, that you should take. Values, they put it in terms of indifference because you cannot be sure about achieving the values. You can be sure about taking the effort to achieve. So what you would call the third one, uh, they would call it uh, preferred indifference. So they are preferred. That is something that you would want to have happen. You would act towards it, but you do not directly control it. So that's how they would, they would look at it. So let, let me, oh, go ahead, uh, Peter, you want to add? Just something? one more, identi just uh, to add something to what you said, uh, just to be perfectly clear, uh, the point in stoicism is they are not, for example, when you take health, that you can have some influence on your health. You can, you know, run and you have, you can eat healthy and so on and so on. You can have some influence, of course. This and the, the Stoics are not saying that you, you have no influence on on your health. The Stoics say that you are not having 100% influence on that. that. That is not in your only authority. And therefore you need to treat some, uh, it as something indifferent. Of course, good health is preferred indifferent and so on, but it is on the other side of the line still. So that would be excellent. Would uh, be thank you. So l we are going to take two more questions and then we're going to go to the breakout room. So it's going to be Joe followed by Alex. Joe, go ahead. Hi, thank you for uh, joining us today. This has been an awesome uh, presentation. What is the defining characteristic between a Orthodox Stoic sage and a Reform Stoic sage, or what would be the difference? How would you characterize it? Uh, I believe that uh, when, from the sage's perspective, uh, uh, in Reform Stoicism, uh, a sage is much more, in a way, fallible, much more uh, aware that uh, he or she may fall, right? In, in, in original studies, this is much more like uh, this kind of epiphany that it's, uh, at some point you, you work so hard that then you kind of, you know, something clicks and you turn uh, into a stoic uh, and you, 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 you are a stoic ever since. Uh, of course, this is not naive. They they all they are aware of all the particularities. But in the reform stoicism, still there's there is much more emphasis on this kind of process processual aspect. That is, there there is a certain dynamic in it that you need to, in a way, every day you wake up, you need to have to put conscious effort in the idea of becoming a stoic and trying to hold onto this stoic. Uh, stoic ideal. That's, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that, of course, we know that, you know, the paradox of, of virtue that you have it 100% or you don't have it at all, and so on and so on. Uh, but that being said, uh, the, I, I may say that today the idea of the, of the sage is much more, in a way, it, it's softer, right? That we are aware not only of our fallibility, but also of the fact that we, are, we may do some progress in stoicism, and even achieve some pinnacles of, you know, of stoic indifference, of stoic happiness, but it's, it's still not perfect in the sense that the ancients would, uh, would have it. So in a way, softer, more self-aware uh, understanding of it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, last question is going to be from Alex. Alex, go ahead. Great, thanks, Rikant. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter, for your uh, for your talk. Um, I have a question about. I guess it's about the uh, the reasons for becoming a Stoic um, on your Reformed version. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you mentioned that um, you know Stoicism may not work for everybody. It may be that for some people Stoicism is the best choice, but for others maybe different, a different philosophy would suit them best. And um, so I wonder, 
what you would say to this? Um, I have this observation that a lot of people come to Stoicism because they're looking for some kind of objective truth. They're looking for, you know, something, maybe something like a foundation. Um, and often, you know, there is this kind of disillusionment um, with relativism, with the kind of uh, position that says, you know, we all choose our life and choose our destiny. Um, and, you know, that tends to go towards nihilism. And I think, you know, many people te are, are becoming more and more disillusioned with that kind of lost, you know, and looking for something to something more stable. And I'm wondering what you would say to people like that. I mean, I would put myself in that category, for example, mm -hmm. you know, that's what's attracted me to stoicism itself. And I guess the danger with the other approach is that we get very close to this idea, which is also an ancient idea that man is the measure of all things, right? Um, and that of course is a very different school. Like that's uh, the sophists used to say that, or the um, ancient skeptics used to say that. Um, so I'm wondering what you might say to a person like that, um, you know, when it comes to the reformed version also that um, you're, you've written about? Oh, thank you. That's, I believe it's a very in-depth question. That's a very radical, very serious question. Thank you for that. I, I can tell you one thing. Uh, I believe that because you mentioned objective truth and so on, and the other hand, uh, relativism and nihilism and so on. So I believe that in a way, uh, optimism uh, and, the, and the the hope, the, the promise of, of reform stoicism, of stoicism today is that uh, using your terms, is that even if you are kind of disillusioned, even if you kind of fail to believe in this objective truth of well-organized universe where everything is so rational and so on and so on, that if you, if, even if you, if you kind of um, uh, are, you know, if, if you are disillusioned with that, uh, the, the optimism of stoicism is that the 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 other that that uh, that that it is not true that the only solution then is full relativism and subjectivity and nihilism that there is a middle path in a way and this is something I was trying you know this this is something I was trying to outline here this path of autonomy uh, temperance but also responsibility and uh, trying to um, apply all those principles consciously to your own life and so on and so on and so on. That would be it, that uh, this kind of um, uh, being self-aware that these principles may be very fragile when you apply it, uh, when you apply them to your own life, which doesn't make them, uh, which doesn't nullify them. That would be my answer here. And uh, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. This was great. So now we come to, uh, now. Uh, everybody's going, we're going to break it up into small groups and we're going to discuss what we, what we just heard. And then we're going to come back and talk about our takeaways. I'm starting the breakout rooms now. <laughs>